academics and the media want you to believe that monogamy is making us miserable, that marriage is some archaic institution that we need to get rid of, that really we should all just be single, child-free, polyamorous, but the data actually shows that all of that is what's making us sad, that the happiest people are married people, that the happiest people having the most fulfilling sexual lives are actually Christian married people. And here today to talk about all of this is Dr. Brad Wilcox. He is a professor of sociology and director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. His latest book, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization, argues that the real way to satisfaction and fulfillment and the real way to ensure that America flourishes is by getting married and having kids. So we're going to talk about that, all the data that supports that on today's episode of Relatable, which is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Dr. Wilcox, thanks so much for taking the time to join us again. So you have a new book out, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save civilization. You're really, in my opinion, like the foremost voice, one of the most prominent advocates of getting married and having kids in an age where all the experts are saying, don't do that. Don't have kids. Don't get married. Be polyamorous or just stay single forever and do what you want to do to pursue happiness. So tell us a little bit just why you wrote this book in the midst of all of that. Yeah, Ali, I was raised by a single mom, and I've kind of done a lot of research indicating the, the value and the power of marriage for children. But as I've been talking to students at the University of Virginia, what I've been hearing, especially from the young women that I speak with, is kind of a pervasive sense of concern, uh, of fear about the future for them when it comes to relationships and especially marriage. And they just wonder, they worry that they're not going to be able to find a guy who is worthy of commitment or kind of interested in committing um, and would make a good, you know, husband down the road. So my more recent conversations with students and then just kind of looking at the sort of statistical landscape now have me very concerned about the impact of these larger trends on marriage for adults. And so that's what kind of led me to do this book. It's really trying to give people a sense of why marriage is important, you know, for young adults, and then also some ideas about how they can forge strong and stable unions today. You talk about this New Yorker article that argues that not only is marriage maybe inhibited for people's happiness, but that specifically Christianity and the marriage that it encourages actually stops people from being as happy as they could be or flourishing as much as they should. And so what do you say to something like that? That really is the popular narrative today. Yeah, there's just so many media pieces out there, Ali, that are you know basically giving people a pretty negative view of marriage and a negative view of the role that religious faith plays typically in Americans' lives. So this New Yorker article basically was suggesting that Christian men are porn addled, their wives are upset with them, and this is leading to any number of, you know, pathologies in their relationships, their lives, and their marriages, and that, you know, Christian men are divorcing um, their husbands more in terms of, you know, because they're upset with their use of pornography. Now, I think we all understand and appreciate that Christian men using pornography does create real challenges both for them and for their marriages. So I'm not kind of mm-hmm. denying that that idea. But what was striking about this New Yorker piece was that it had kind of no broader context. It did not tell the audience that on average, Christian men are less likely to use pornography compared to men who are secular. That on average, um, Christian couples are less likely to get divorced if they go to church than couples who are secular or non-attending. And that, as my new book shows, there's no group of Americans who actually have more sex um, and have better sex than religious couples in the U.S. So when you're attending church together, what I find is that about 65% of church going couples have sex at least once a week, and less than half of secular couples have sex once a week. I was really kind of blown away by that, that finding. Didn't expect to see that difference. And then when it comes to sexual satisfaction, we see again that 
uh, religious couples are, are much more likely to be sexually satisfied than secular couples. So the broader point here is that, you know, and this is a great example of the way in which kind of the media is painting a negative portrait of the faith and family connection. And yet we see in the data is that on average, the link between faith and family is strong, including when it comes to um, this most uh, controversial topic, and that is sort of sex, marriage, and faith in America. All right, first sponsor of the day is Adele Natural Cosmetics. I've been talking about them for years now because I truly love their products. They're all natural, toxin-free skin care products and makeup that I just adore. I started using them a few years ago. It's made a really big difference in my skin. Uh, I wasn't really doing anything to take care of my face. I was using like whatever face wash I had lying around. I don't even know if I was using any moisturizer. And then I started using the facial cleansing oil, the essential line from Adele Natural Cosmetics. It's made my skin so much smoother and softer, less irritated. Also, when I'm not in studio, I love wearing their cream foundation, their cream blush. It's got good coverage while still being lightweight. And I love the family that owns Adele Natural Cosmetics. They are unapologetically Christian and pro-life. So if you want really high quality toxin-free products to put on your face and body, then go to AdeleNaturalCosmetics.com. You can use code Allie for 25% off your first time purchase. AdeleNaturalCosmetics.com, code Allie. I mean, what is the motivating factor behind trying to paint marriage and monogamy, particularly Christian marriage, as something that is an obstacle to happiness rather than just uh, echoing what the data actually says, as you said, that people in these marriages are much more likely to be sexually satisfied and just happy in general? Is it kind of like, in your assessment, a misery loves company thing going on here? Or is it just kind of the progressive biases we see playing out in the media? Yeah, I think there are a couple of factors here. So in the book, um, and in fact, in the preface, I kind of detail how for a long time, the left has been kind of taking, um, you know, swipes at marriage. Mm -hmm. And I talk about a piece in Bloomberg that suggests that women are richer if they forego marriage. I talk about a piece in the New York Times that suggests that marriage is a route to, to misery for women. So that's kind of, I think your audience would kind of be aware of that, but there's also kind of a newer dynamic here playing out as well. And that is the online right. People like Andrew Tate and Pearl Davis are also now attacking marriage. Mm. And they're saying that marriage is a bad deal for men. You know, there's so much divorce out there that, you know, men are basically taken uh, to the cleaners by their wives on many occasions. So what we have now, Ali, is that the, on, sort of the online right is attacking marriage, and then the sort of the mainstream left is attacking marriage. The online right is sort of targeting men, and the mainstream left is targeting women. Hmm. But their bottom line basically is that folks should just steer clear of marriage. And I think that they're doing this in part from a place of pain. I think there are plenty of, hmm. of men who've been divorced unwillingly and they're upset and they gravitate towards this online right perspective. And there are plenty of women who've been frustrated in their marriages or frustrated in their relationships or frustrated that they can't find a guy who's sort of worthy of marriage from their perspective. And they're more likely to take a very dim view of marriage as well. But finally, you kind of touched on the progressive angle here. And that is that I think the progressive assumption is that every new pattern, every new fashion that comes down the family pike, the relationship pike is just great. You know, that we should always kind of embrace that which is new. And so I think that explains in part why this newest fashion, polyamory, has been getting so many um, glowing uh, media hits in places like the New York yes. Times and New York Magazine. Yes. Okay. I definitely want to talk about polyamory and what you said about the um, kind of progressive assault on marriage. And I think you made a really good, insightful distinction there that I'm so interested in fleshing out more that both the online right, which I don't think is representative of mainstream conservatives, but the kind of, I don't know if I would call it far right, but as you said, the very, mm. um, the uh, online type of right wing media figures who might describe themselves as red pill 
Um, as right. you said, exactly. they right. are targeting men in that they're saying, look at how women and specifically feminists have taken advantage of men and look at how everything is stacked against men. Men are blamed for everything, but really women are the problem. Really women are the ones exploiting men. Really women are the ones taking advantage of men in the relationship. Really it's uh, women who are the problem in all of this. So why would you even get married? Just have fun with you, who you want to have fun with. Why even make that investment? Why even take that risk when a woman, because of the divorce laws in this country, could walk away with everything? That's kind of the narrative um, that you yes. hear. I'd love to hear just more from you on that, like where you think that comes from. If you think that this is going to be a fad that lasts, is there any truth to what they're saying? What are your thoughts? So I think this is going to be with us for <clears throat> for a while, unfortunately. And I think it's a consequence of the fact that we are seeing a growing divide between the sexes, partially ideological, where a lot of young men are kind of moving to the right to some extent, and even more women are moving to the left. And so, you know, this dynamic creates, um, you know, a, a kind of separation between the sexes and a skepticism and even hostility between the sexes. There's also, I think, um, a dynamic too, where um, you know, dating apps often kind of disadvantage a certain, you know, share of men and make them more angry, you know, about um, the opposite sex as well. And so this kind of feeds into the, um, the audience for this red pill, right, as you described it. And then, too, there are, you know, men who've been divorced unwillingly and for reasons that wouldn't be counted, I think, as legitimate. You know, I know, for instance, a, a guy whose wife left him for, you know, their kid's piano teacher, and a good husband, you know. All the, you know, all yeah. there was nothing really explicable about, you know, what happened, and right. and he wasn't treated very well in family court in Virginia. So there are, you know, guys like, you know, like this gentleman that I know who could be attracted to the red pill right for um, mm -hmm. for that reason as well. So these are some of the factors that are driving this, and I think the algorithms online kind of only, you know, sort of deepen sometimes, you know, some men's hostility towards uh, women and their um, their lack of faith in the possibility of finding love and, yeah. you know, forging a strong marriage. Yeah. And I just see this mentality on both the right and the left, but in different ways, this disbelief that strong, happy marriages exist where both mm -hmm. the man and the woman, yeah, sure. They have arguments and conflicts, but they're happy. They're satisfied. They have a good life. They've kind of figured out as much as they can the dynamics. And certainly there's a disbelief, I would say, particularly on the left, that there are happy Christian marriages where there's not some like secret compartments in the people's lives where they're actually deeply unhappy with their station in life and the fact that they're married. It's a total disbelief that there are people that exist who are happily married and just live normal, truthful, honest productive, responsible lives together. They like being moms and dads. They like being husbands and wives. They're okay with their roles. It's, I don't know if it's just um, a product of being perpetually online and just kind of having your little silos of ideology. Um, or if it's that, because like you said, because they've been hurt in their own lives, it's difficult to believe that there are people who are happily married right. and in relationships out there. Yeah, well, obviously, there, there are tons of kids, you know, who've been raised in, for instance, divorced homes, including homes that may have been, you know, Christian in some way, you know, stripe or, or other. And so, um, again, I think sometimes we're kind of talking about people who are coming from a place of pain and, and then writing, you know, about marriage or writing about Christianity in ways that are that are shaped by their own negative experiences. But I think what's unfortunate about some of these dynamics is that they're kind of not putting, you know, the larger picture into perspective here. And one of the things that my book does, again, is to sort of show how for the average American, marriage is a pathway to meaning, to prosperity oftentimes, and to happiness. And that most married men and women are happily married today. And that most married couples, you know, Contra Andrew Tate or Pearl Davis, will actually go the distance. Divorce is down since 1980. And that means practically that we're not seeing a one in two pattern where one and two couples are getting mm -hmm. divorced um, in this country. And when you account for 
we hear very often that divorce inside the Christian church is the same rate as divorce outside mm, the sure. church. But when you account for particular factors like actual church attendance, couples who pray together, couples who really are taking their faith seriously together, you do see that divorce rate drop dramatically, right? Yeah, that's striking. In the book, I report that uh, people who are attending church are 30 to 50 percent less likely to get divorced, depending upon the data set. I am relying here in part on Tyler Vanderweel, a professor at Harvard of biostatistics who has done work in this space. So there's just my evidence, his evidence, others, you know, kind of just showing that for most people, being a part of a church community is a source of strength for your marriage. Um, and not the opposite. And one of the, the broader points here is that birds of a feather flock together. And what we know from work done by Nicholas Christakis at Yale is that basically divorce is sort of highly um, socialized. It sort of is transmitted from one friend to the other, from one family to the other. And what that means practically is that your odds of getting divorced are just much, much higher if you're surrounded by friends and family who get divorced because, you know, all of us have difficulties mm -hmm. and challenges in our marriages. And so if your best friend is getting divorced in the face of an ordinary challenge, you're more likely to do the same thing. But by contrast, if you're surrounding yourselves with people who take, <clears throat> you know, a high value of their marriage and navigate their challenges successfully, like many church grown couples do, then your odds of divorce are going to fall. Okay, next sponsor is another company I love so much, and that is Seven Weeks Coffee. The reason it's called Seven Weeks Coffee is because at the uh, gestational age of seven weeks, the baby inside the womb is the size of a coffee bean, and Seven Weeks Coffee exists not just to provide excellent coffee, but also to try to protect every beating heart. How it does that is by taking 10% of every sale and donating it to pro-life organizations and pregnancy centers across the country. The these entities are providing all the tools and the resources that a mom needs to keep her child and to choose life for her child. And we've talked about these pregnancy centers before offering not just material resources, but also spiritual, emotional counseling as well. And so if you buy your coffee from Seven Weeks Coffee, you're not just getting the sustainably sourced, super high quality coffee. You are also allowing the coffee that you drink to serve a higher purpose and to save lives. We love Seven Weeks Coffee in our home. Go to Seven Weeks coffee.com use code ally for 10 percent off your order that's seven weeks coffee.com code ally you talked about this trend of kind of like polyamory but before we get to that i do want to talk a little bit more about because i think that we really do kind of have a progressive zeitgeist you the ubiquitousness of the progressive influence um, is obvious to most people, I think, watching this podcast, probably more than they're familiar with kind of like the red pill side. And I think we could probably safely say that most influential institutions in this country, um, they're dominated, at least to some extent, by progressive ideology. And I came across this TikTok video that I thought typifies this um, progressive mentality. Maybe she wouldn't even see it as progressive. It's more like self-love, self-fulfillment, self-satisfaction, right. which I I do deem to be progressive, but this, I think, typifies so much of the mentality about marriage and singleness. And so I just wanted to play this TikTok and um, have you respond to it. Day in the life of a single woman who doesn't believe in marriage or want children. I spent most of my adult life in a long-term partnership that was safe and comfortable, but deep down I was starving for emotional connection. For years I ignored my gut feeling that I was deeply unhappy and hoped it would somehow magically get better. At the time, I couldn't fathom being happily single because I didn't even know it was a possibility. I'd never seen it represented before. It doesn't mean that I don't want to be in a partnership ever again, but I have zero desire to have children, so I'm comfortable waiting it out. In the current political and economic climate, there is no guarantee that I can successfully raise a child with the life of abundance they deserve and I'm enjoying spending my hard-earned money on me. I thought that, that last part was funny. Oh, I want to give a child the abundance they deserve and I want to spend my money on me. That's really kind of what it comes down to. So this is, I mean, this is yeah. everywhere on social media, totally being glorified. What's your take on it? Yeah, I talk about this as a kind of a Midas mindset, Ali, where we're basically kind of telling through media and pop culture and now social media that Americans could should steer clear from marriage and family, you know, and towards mammon, broadly defined, towards mm. work, 
towards money and you know the unencumbered life. So it's all about freedom from yes. family rather than freedom for family. Mm -hmm. And what people don't realize is that as Aristotle taught us, we're social animals and we're hardwired to connect. And we're just much more likely to be flourishing in terms of meaning and happiness and loneliness being you know, lower um, when we're married with kids. In fact, there's no group of Americans today who are happier than married fathers and married mothers. And that story is told obviously in my book, Get Married, but it's not told in many mainstream media platforms as you all know. Yes, there was a very recent CNN article that said that, that said, you know, no matter how you analyze the data, what you're going to find is that married people tend to be far happier than those who are not. Um, the poll author, Jonathan Rothwell, is the Gallup poll. Um, he said, we see a fairly large and notable advantage to being married in terms of how people evaluate uh, their lives. Married adults who did not attend high school uh, evaluate their lives more favorably than unmarried adults with a graduate degree. Very often we're told like the measure of happiness is through education. The measure of happiness is through how much money you make. And really that's not what the, what the data shows. Yeah. So that's that Gallup poll is really on the money. My own book shows basically, yeah, education and money do predict happiness, but nothing predicts happiness in our regression models and our statistics like a good marriage, mm. not sex, not money, not, you know, not anything. And so that story is, I think, not being told enough to our young adults and to, um, you know, Americans more generally. Yeah. And it's it's really such a shame. It's so interesting in a culture that prioritizes or we say that we prioritize happiness more than anything else that's what you hear especially among young people i just want to be happy i just want to be happy i just want to be happy and yet we're it's conflicting messages uh so i think yeah, yeah i think ahead. the paradox the paradox of happiness you know from you know both the christian tradition and the classical tradition as well like aristotle is there's a recognition that kind of directly pursuing happiness or directly pursuing your own kind of immediate desires is the path actually not towards happiness, but the path towards misery. Mm -hmm. And by contrast, the, you know, the path to happiness actually is paved both through virtue and through kind of making a gift of yourself to others, including, of course, uh, a spouse and kids. Yeah, that's certainly true within Christianity. He who is willing to lose his life will find it. And I guess it makes sense that that kind of spiritual and eternal and deep truth would be confusing to a world that seems to be only interested in the material. All right, next sponsor for the day is Cozy Earth. Okay, I've gotten my whole family hooked on Cozy Earth. Yes, we love their sheets. We love their towels, but we also love their loungewear. My dad, my husband, the chief related bro, he's obsessed with his Cozy Earth hoodie and his loungewear absolutely loves it because it's made from high quality viscous that is super soft and really breathable. I absolutely love my cozy earth sheets. I could never go back to any other sheets. I'm absolutely spoiled by it. I even got some for our guest room because they're just so great. You can save up to 35% on cozy earth loungewear, pajamas, bedding, bath towels, and more if you use my code relatable at at CozyEarth.com slash Relatable. So go to CozyEarth.com slash Relatable. Use promo code Relatable to save up to 35% on all Cozy Earth products. Trust me, you will not regret it. Um, so I'm interested in talking to you about polyamory. Um, there was this big piece, I think it was in the New Yorker, a practical guide for the curious couple. This is something else that's being so glorified is why don't we just leave this archaic idea of monogamy, which is so, uh, they would say, I don't know, anti-human and not um, you know, it, it's not with the times anymore. It's not catching up to what people really want and how we really are. And so we need to just be free to have multiple relationships at once. What's the truth about polyamory? Yeah, so I think it's, you know, it's one example of the way in which the media and many other cultural elites are kind of advancing this idea that we need to maximize sexual choices, maximize relationship choices for people, you know, keep every option open. And 
it's also, I think, part and parcel of, again, a kind of progressive assumption that every new fashion that comes down the yeah. pike needs to be baptized as, you know, holy and, and good. The problem, of course, with polyamory from an adult's perspective is that I mean, I'm married. I've been married 28 years. And like, you know, I struggle to give my wife the attention, the affection and the, and the money, if you will, that she that she needs and deserves. Right. And the idea that just practically speaking you know, here for a second, that I could like extend the, yeah. my, my attentions in other directions is just you know, it's laughable. Right? right. So that's, I think, part of the challenge. But I think also there's no recognition that this would be a disaster and is a disaster for children. Um, mm. You know, we know that kids are more likely to be harmed when they're in the presence of unrelated strangers, you know, in the household, mm. especially unrelated males. There's a lot of evidence on this score. We know from evidence derived from studies of polygamous, you know, households um, in other parts of the world, that kids in polygamous households tend to do worse than kids in nuclear families in those other regions across the world. So the point I'm getting at is that monogamy serves important <clears throat> social, emotional, and financial goods for adults, uh, for children, and even for the community. There's a Harvard scholar named Joseph Heinrich who's just written a lot about how monogamy has actually powered the rise of the West. Um, so okay. this this whole push for polyamory is just so naive. And we even see, ironically, in this book by Molly Roden Winter, who's the you know the sort of celeb right now being profiled for all these polyamory stories, that when you actually read her book more. There is so much sadness yes. communicated by her about the ways in which her husband kind of pushed her into this way of life. So, you know, this is going to lead to a lot of heartache and a lot of broken families and a lot of hurt kids is kind of the bottom line. Yes. And that's what I see a lot in these kind of TikTok polyamory influencers when they're talking about their relationships and giving people advice on how to navigate polyamorous relationships, there's a lot of what I would call cope. Like they mm -hmm. are, um, they talk about untraining their minds um, from, you know, the the right. remnants of monogamy right. that are still in there. And, oh, when I feel jealous because my partner is on a date with his new girlfriend, you know, that's just me being selfish or that's just me right. not being progressive enough. But I have to retrain my heart and my mind to embracing the openness of our relationship and realizing that more love for another person doesn't mean less love for me. I mean, they're just pushing down right. their right and basic instincts mm -hmm. that are, is crying out for stability and monogamy. Right. And the, and the thing is, is that all the polling tells us, you know, that women are much less interested in this than men are. Um, and so, again, we have this crazy situation where this progressive impulse is leading us down a road that is, you know, making women <laughs> more miserable. Yes. And it's just, it's a sad, you know, part of the story is that this actually ends up making women disadvantaged and in a sense, women unequal in terms of who gets the attention, the affection, the financial resources in these newer relationships. Yes. 51% of adults younger than 30 told Pew Research in 2023, this is according to the New Yorker, that open marriage was acceptable. I guess that's marriage in which, you know, you can have other relationships outside of the marriage. And 20% of all Americans report experimenting with some form of non-monogamy. Well, that's very troubling. I assume that it's troubling to you, too. Yeah, it is. And one of the things that my book talks about, too, is sort of the power of commitment, the power of fidelity. And what I find in my book is that um, couples today who would embrace sort of this classic, ec this classic ethic of fidelity, of saying to what's called the general social survey that, you know, infidelity is always wrong, um, they are significantly more likely to be happily married. And, you know, I mean, this is not rocket science to you and to me, but it's just it's just worth mm -hmm. underlying that one of the key purposes of marriage across cultures is to just kind of keep the sirens at bay um, and to focus your attentions and your affections on your spouse. And so couples who are doing that successfully are just more likely to be flourishing. And that's that reality is not acknowledged, unfortunately, in a lot of the elite uh, precincts that are writing about <clears throat> and discussing uh, love and relationships and marriage today. 
Yes. And you retweeted this tweet from someone named Shadi Hamid. And I think that this is absolutely true. And it gives words to kind of a thought that I was having a couple of minutes ago. He said a self-fulfilling prophecy might be at work when it comes to polyamory. Polyamory becomes more widespread because we think it's already widespread. Norms around sexuality change because we think they've changed even if they haven't. Gosh, I think that's true about a lot of things when it comes to the progressive sexual revolution. You start hearing about it more and more and more and you think wow this is happening it must not be that big of a deal things become destigmatized and so you're more likely to engage in it when really it was just a tiny portion of society to begin with exactly i think this is how a lot of the cultural changes that have kind of washed over our country there's a similar story when it comes to divorce revolution for instance in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, the kind of the me first mentality that kind of took hold among so many young married couples, you know, in that moment in our history. And that's, I think, now happening with polyamory as well. So, and again, what you're going to see is, unfortunately, I think here is that a lot of working class and poor young adults who are getting these messages um, are going to be most susceptible to them and their kids are going to pay the biggest price for all of this. Yes. And you, so you did it, you did this thread and you were, um, uh, you were refuting some points that have been made about the dangers of monogamy. And what you said was that monogamy actually reduces things like rape, murder, assault, robbery and fraud or it can um and it actually increases economic activity child protection child investment it reduces rates of child neglect abuse accidental death monogamy does that not just having the two right. presence of loving mm-hmm. adults or the yep. the presence of two loving adults but actually monogamy does that that's amazing and again, this is the Harvard <clears throat> evolutionary anthropologist, uh, Joseph Heinrich, yes. who's, you know, who's making these claims. Um, I don't think he's a conservative. I don't think he, I mean, I don't know, you know him personally, but he is a very eminent scholar and he's been studying kind of uh, kinship culture, you know, across time and across cultural, um, across culture. So, you know, his, his point basically is that we can kind of organize obviously our kinship and sexual relationships in any number of different combinations, but monogamy by kind of giving a stable structure to women and men and by increasing the odds that men are married to one woman um, is much more likely to be conducive to a strong and stable social order. All right, last sponsor for the day is Birch Gold. Lots of happening in the world, lots of global instability as we get into this election season and you just want to make sure that your savings are protected. It's not too late to diversify an old IRA or 401k into gold. Birch Gold Group can help you do that. Uh, As opposed to many other kinds of investments, gold thrives in times of instability and uncertainty. It's an important part of diversifying your savings, and Birch Gold is the way to help you do that. They've got a ton of five-star reviews. People absolutely love working with Birch Gold. They've got great customer service, super trustworthy, and you if you just want to learn more about it, you don't even know what it means to diversify into gold, then you can get a free no obligation info kit. Just text Allie to 989-898. Claim your free info kit. Protect your savings with gold today. Text Allie to 989-898. Here's an example of someone who says her her description on her page says, my life as a solo poly person is extremely fulfilling. So here she is explaining that. I'm poly as fuck, y'all, but I know that many of you don't understand what that means. So I'm going to draw you a diagram to explain what my life looks like as a solo poly person. So I am at the center and I am my primary partner. There are people who I'm exploring, people who I'm dating, my friends with benefits who I'm romantic with and sexual with, my lovers who I'm sexual with, my partners who I'm 10 toes down with, satellites who come in and out of my life, and playmates who I play with in the kink and swinging spaces. 
Okay, so I've seen a lot of things like this and just explaining who their partner's with, who their partners are connected to. I mean, really, this isn't that much of a new concept, is it? We've just kind of put a new trendy name on it. I mean, people have been promiscuous for a long time. That's basically how you get STDs. So I, I'm not really sure why this is becoming like a trend on social media. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the dynamic here is that kind of we're just building on on past trends. But I think where this is headed, right, is towards a new legal regime and mm. a new cultural status. Yeah. So that polyamorous, you know, families will be established legally. They'll be given normative support culturally. And again, the concern here is that it's going to make it harder for people who are trying to kind of live the sort of older model uh, or the classic model when it comes to monogamous marriage. Um, because they're going to be, you know, exposed to this, you know, newer uh, model, and it's going to be, you know, a temptation for some, you know, spouses. Um, and then again, who's going to be hurt the most by all this? It's going to be kids. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's what terrifies me the most. I mean, as you already mentioned, kids are much more likely to be abused or neglected when there is a non-related adult, especially a non-related male that's in the home. And you have so much strife and even just exacerbated, I think, chaos and instability that goes on in these kinds of relationships um, that kids are just thrown in the midst of all of that. Kids, once again, have to bear the brunt of our social sexual experiments. Do you think this is the natural progression of Obergefell? I mean, evangelicals at the time said, oh, if we redefine marriage to be anything between a man and a woman, you're going to open up the door to all kinds of redefinitions that is, again, going to, you know, hurt the institution of marriage, which is the foundation of a free society, but it's also going to hurt children. And of course, we were mocked mercilessly for saying something like that. But is this one of the natural consequences of that? I think you can certainly make that argument, although, of course, many of the proponents of same-sex marriage, you know, were arguing for, um, you know, just a two-person arrangement. But I think it's part and parcel of just a broader shift away from kind of seeing marriage's core orientation to providing the ideal context for the bearing and rearing of children. And we've kind of been on this trajectory, you know, since the 1960s, including with the, uh, you know, the advent of no-fault divorce. So we're just kind of headed in a moment where a lot of the norms and customs and laws that tended to sort of strengthen monogamous marriage, strengthen the intact family, you know, connect kids to their own parents, have, you know, basically either just eroded, disappeared, or are in the process right now of, um, of weakening. But on the, on the good news front, I think it's important just to stress um, two points here. One is that we actually have seen a bit of an uptick in the share of kids being raised in intact married families. I think in part because, for better and for worse, marriage and parenthood have become more selective in recent years. And then, too, we are seeing on the sort of social science front, you know, just continuing evidence that kids benefit from marriage. Um, and not just that they benefit, but they benefit even more from having married parents today than it was the case in, in one study 17 years ago and a different study about 30 years ago. So, for instance, when it comes, just to give you one example, when it comes to uh, marriage and college completion, um, work that I've done with my colleague, Dr. Wendy Wang, shows that the connection between coming from a stable married family um, and going and graduating from college is stronger in more recent years than it was, say, 30 or 40 years ago with the baby boomer cohort. So I think that tells us that sort of the intellectual case uh, for marriage is not just there today, but it's probably getting even stronger when it comes to the welfare of children. Um, and Dr. Wilcox, could you remind us what the family diversity theory is? So the family diversity theory is this kind of idea that what really matters for families is love and money, and that it doesn't really matter whether or not, you know, the parents are married. So any kind of combination is sort of equally good for kids, and kids just need, again, their parents' attention and affection, that's love, and enough money, financial resources to kind of thrive. And what this perspective, I think, doesn't recognize, doesn't appreciate is that, um, number one, when you kind of look at different kids' outcomes, you know, in my book, we find, for instance, that boys who are raised in any kind of non-intact family, whether it's a single parent family or a step family or an adoptive family, are more likely to land in prison or in jail than they are to graduate from college. And by contrast, boys who are raised by their own married parents are more likely to graduate from college, about four times more likely 
than they are to spend any time in jail or in prison. So this kind of family diversity perspective doesn't really kind of appreciate the facts on the ground. And then it also doesn't appreciate the ways in which married parents typically have more time to give their kids the attention and affection they need. They're more likely to give kids what's called authoritative disciplines, kind of constructive discipline. And they also have more money because family instability, you know, alley is often very expensive, you know, court costs, things like that. And single parents typically obviously have less money than married parents. So this family diversity theory doesn't kind of recognize that for ordinary kids, married parents are more likely to give them the attention and the affection that they need to thrive and have the money they need to support them adequately. Got it. Okay. You talk about how marriage is necessary for the American dream. What is meant by that? So um, what we know from the work of Raj Chetty, a Harvard economist, is that there are parts of this country where kids who are born poor are much more likely to stay poor. And other parts of the country where kids who are born poor have a much higher likelihood of rising economically, kind of that rags to riches story about the American dream kind of it would be understood as. And so we know, for instance, that, you know, Salt Lake City metro area is a lot more mobility for poor kids than, say, a region like Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the big differences separating out Atlanta from Salt Lake City is there are many more two-parent families in Salt Lake City. And having a context, a communal, you know, context where your kids are surrounded by um, lots of two-parent families is conducive to more mobility. So that's just kind of one example of the way in which the American dream is stronger in communities and neighborhoods and states um, where uh, there are more married families, more two-parent families in the mix. And tell me what, um, can you define the closing of the American heart? That's a concept that you also discuss in your book. Yeah, so um, the good news, as I mentioned before, I think is that we do see a lot of you know happily married uh, folks today. We do see the share of kids who are being raised in stable married families. It looks like it's, it's ticking upwards. But the bad news is what I call the closing of the American heart is that adults are having so much more difficulty, so much more trouble in getting married and dating and, and having kids. And so we're seeing dating is down, marriage is down, uh, fertility is down. Uh, my colleague Lyman Stone estimates that about one in four of today's young adults will never have kids. I've seen research suggesting that about one in three young adults today will never have um, a spouse. So we're just seeing many more kinless adults kind of coming into our society. And that's problematic because they're much more likely to succumb to deaths of despair. This is based upon work by Jonathan Rothbo from Gallup, whom you just referenced a little bit ago. And then when it comes to happiness, we're seeing evidence from the University of Chicago that the number one factor that accounts for falling rates of happiness in America, Ali, is the decline in marriage. So Jefferson talked about the pursuit of happiness as fundamental in the Declaration. And what we're seeing is that across America, more and more Americans are having difficulty realizing that pursuit in part because they're less likely to be married. Mm. And where can people find your book if they want to know more about this? Um, Get Married is available on Amazon. My website is bradwilcox.com and then familystudies.org is a great place to see lots of different family uh, reports and blog posts. Well, Dr. Wilcox, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. And I do encourage people to read your book and also follow you because you're also um, always tweeting a lot of interesting statistics. So thank you so (laughs) much. Okay. Thanks, Allie. I appreciate it.